Listen now to what the Gospel of Mark says about the nativity and the birth of Jesus. That's right. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) Zero. Zero. The Gospel of Mark, which nearly every scholar believes was the first of the four canonical Gospels to be written, says nothing about the nativity of Jesus. Nothing. Nothing about angels or dreams or Zechariah or Elizabeth or Joseph or Mary or shepherds or Magi or King Herod. Nothing. Of course, that didn't mean, doesn't mean that the author Mark didn't know about these things. He likely did know about these things. He likely simply chose not to include any of them in his gospel. Maybe he thought the other things that he included in his gospel were more important. Maybe he didn't have room or time or resources to include anything about Jesus' ancestry or birth and sort of got to fit it all in a scroll and the scroll could only get so big. After all, Mark's gospel is, it is the shortest of the four gospels. It's the most concise. It contains the least material, the least number of words. So let's turn to the gospel of John. And listen to what John wrote about the nativity and the birth of Jesus. Nothing. Again. Absolutely nothing. John, which was the last of the four Gospels to be written, also, just like Mark, didn't include anything about the, in his Gospel about angels or dreams, or shepherds, or magi, or Zechariah, or Elizabeth, or Joseph, or Mary, or King Herod, or any of that. Nothing. Though John did include something about all of that, and he certainly he knew about that, right? He's got Matthew and Luke's Gospels available to him, accessible to him. He knew of them. They were written much before his writing, much before he sat down to write. But John did write in his prologue in some of the opening lines some interesting words. Uh, Listen closely. This is the word of God from John chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. The word, which is uh, a way that John referred to Jesus that would have made unique sense to his Greek audience. The word of the Lagos. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Became flesh incarnation. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Rewind to verse 9 of chapter 1. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own. Again, he came, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Again, John hints at, acknowledges that he came into this world in a unique and different way. But that's about as close as John gets to the nativity story right there. Even though the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, which contain all that we know about the prophecies concerning Jesus' birth and his actual birth and his lineage and all of that, John has, has those in his library. But John wants to do something different. He wants to tell Jesus' story differently. He will emphasize some things differently. John is less interested in Jesus or telling about Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy and Jesus' miraculous birth. He's just not as interested in that. It doesn't mean it's not important. The gospel writer John seems to be more interested, though, in why. Not so much how, but why. Jesus was born, why Jesus came, Jesus' mission and purpose. Not that Matthew, Mark, and Luke weren't interested in that, but John, maybe a little more. About which John drops clues from early in his gospel, that Jesus was somehow God, that he was part of the one trying God, which admittedly is hard to get our minds around, to stretch our minds enough to get around that. That through Jesus, light would come into the world, that God would bring light in some profound and metaphysical way into the world beyond and after creation. That grace and truth would come into the world in some sort of fresh and powerful way that they hadn't up until this point of Jesus and his incarnation. 
That Jesus would overturn so much of conventional religion and understanding about who and how God is. That was part of his mission, his purpose. John's clear about those sorts of things. And that Jesus would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's real clear about that from the beginning. In his own language, in his own metaphors and pictures. It's possible to tell the story of Jesus and what most needs to be known about Jesus without talking about shepherds tending their flocks by night in a starry field and Mary and Joseph's inability to find first-class lodging in Bethlehem and then later royal stargazers bringing gifts to an infant king. Absolutely. It is possible to tell Jesus' story without those things. As I've said, the first and the last of the canonical gospels to be written didn't mention any of these things. But what did they mention? What was important to them? as authors, as storytellers, as conveyors of truth. The gospel writer Luke commits a full quarter of his account of Jesus, in other words, his gospel, to the last week of Jesus' life. The pinnacle of which was Jesus' death on the cross for the sins of the world, Jesus' atoning death. The gospel writers Matthew and Mark commit a third of their gospels to that week in Jesus' life, at the end of which he was crucified in my place and yours. The gospel writer John commits nearly half of his gospel, of his story, of his account of Jesus. Nearly half of his gospel to just that climactic week. Near the beginning of which, in chapter 12, as Jesus' crucifixion gets closer, John records Jesus saying these words. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. And he's not just teaching to teach. He's not just teaching truth or facts. He's teaching autobiographically as well. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Again, John dropping us along the way. This is why Jesus came. Not so much how, but why. Several chapters later in chapter 18 of John's gospel, Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Big, big T, truth. So everything Jesus says, has said, will say, does say, truth. And so listen up, amen, amen, truly, truly. John's interested in telling us why Jesus came, that we might know truth. So there are subtle references to the birth of Jesus in John's gospel, but we, the church, with the help and the encouragement and the nudging of our culture of consumption, have probably overemphasized Jesus' birth even while the four Gospels focus so many of their pages on Jesus' death, his death on a cross by which we and all humanity can be reconciled both to God and to one another, our culture of consumption has helped to nudge the church and Christianity and the Christian faith in that direction. We 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 want stories and things that we can sell and reenact. I know that many of you came this evening expecting to hear a message about a manger or shepherds or angels. Uh, We've covered some of that material at uh, this morning and uh, at the four o'clock service. And most of us know those parts of the story pretty well. The nativity narrative is pretty, pretty, pretty well-known story. And it may be this bigger picture stuff to which the Gospels give so much attention that maybe ought to have more of our attention this evening. A quarter of his Gospel, a third of their Gospels, almost half of John's Gospel to the last week of Jesus' life. To that end, I want to read a little bit more this evening from chapter 17 in John's Gospel, which is... uh, called, it's part of what's called Jesus' farewell discourse, chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, and chapter 17 in particular is called Jesus' high priestly prayer. I want to read a little bit of that. 
which is spoken, prayed by Jesus during that week, the evening before he was crucified. Among other things, he prayed, I will remain uh, in the world no longer, but my followers are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I'll read that again. Holy Father, protect them, Jesus' followers, people who are in Christ, people who know him. Protect them by the power of your name, that they may, that you, the name that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. On to verse 20. My prayer is not for my followers alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So part of why Jesus came was to bring people together, to reconcile people to God vertically, as Paul talks about in the second chapter of Ephesians, but also to reconcile people to one another horizontally, to make us one, to make us brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters out of Christ, not yet in Christ, those who will believe, to make us one. And is this not what the world needs tonight? I don't mean to be negative, Nancy. But all of our education and technology and innovation and science and psychology and methods and wisdom haven't gotten us a lot closer to one another and certainly haven't made us one, either with God or with one another. Some of the worst violence to fellow human beings in history has been done in the name of God and religious zealots of all sorts. Most of us have lived our entire lives knowing that there are nuclear warheads and many of them far more than are necessary. Far more powerful than the ones dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima that are pointed right at us right now and have been our entire lives. Our homes are, in some cases, many fortresses with our advanced alarm systems. The content that Americans have for one another, for those on the other side of the fence or the other side of the tracks, seems to be stronger than ever before, at least in my experience, to say nothing of the disdain that some Americans have toward those who threaten to poison our nation's blood with their own to mess up our pure DNA. For almost two years, one giant nuclear power has been relentlessly bombing another country with the back end of its state-sanctioned church, bombing another country that itself is also a largely Christian country. What is wrong with the picture? It is hard to even read about the evil that's been perpetrated, not with guns or even sort of far off instruments of war, but with people's hands and with their bodies in Israel and in Gaza since October 7th, continuing. What horrible things, because there are a few kids here, I won't go into details, but maybe you have read. The unspeakable and seemingly subhuman things that people continue to do unimaginable horror and Sudan Lord have mercy and the abject poverty that so many millions live in today while many of the world's Christians live in relative abundance and indifference and the modern slavery of sex trafficking that's apparently almost ubiquitous now in so many parts of the world including ours which reminds me of the lyrics of one of our favorite Christmas songs, the first verse of which goes like this, O holy night, the stars are brightly shining, 
It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O hear the angel voices. O night divine, O night when Christ was born. O night, O holy night, O night divine. But there's another verse of O Holy Night that we know and that we have always, most of us have always sung, but which wasn't sung by many Christians in parts of the United States and parts of Europe in the mid-1800s and even beyond when, and when you hear those lyrics, you will know why some Christian worshipers refuse to speak such words. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. And in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Christ the Lord, oh praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. His power and glory evermore proclaim. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. And you know why some Americans didn't want to sing that verse at times in our history. Many years ago, when my family uh, and I first came to First Prez, used to be, how waypoint, we used to be first prayers. A number of things were different, and one of those was there was this 1030 worship service on Christmas Eve that was led by this wonderful choir and uh, some extraordinary music, and toward the end of that service, as it approached midnight, nobody wants to be here at midnight anymore. <laughs> we would celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist together, and honestly, that was a little weird for me. We'd just spent the better part of an hour talking about Jesus' birth. And celebrating his birth, his incarnation. And it was my job to transition us to then remembering Jesus' death, his atoning death, in and through the Lord's Supper, and then get us back to the celebration of Jesus' birth again by singing Silent Night a couple of minutes later. And it was just an awkward juxtaposition for me, at least. So we stopped celebrating communion at that service, and then it all seemed to flow a little bit better, a little bit more uh, nicely. And yet somehow, not forgetting or neglecting the significance of Jesus' birth and God taking on human flesh and doing so in a prophecy-fulfilling and miraculous way, somehow it seems that can't or shouldn't, that we can't or shouldn't attempt to celebrate Jesus' birth without also acknowledging and more than that, affirming and proclaiming that Jesus came in order to forgive and restore and reconcile and unite. Maybe. And yet somehow not forgetting or neglecting the significance of Jesus' birth and God taking on human flesh and doing so in prophecy-fulfilling and miraculous ways, somehow it seems that we can't or shouldn't attempt to celebrate Jesus' birth without also acknowledging and more than that, affirming and proclaiming that Jesus came in order to forgive and restore and reconcile and unite in himself, in and through his blood. At some point in your lives, most of you have probably done at least one pilgrimage to Disneyland. Can I see some hands? And for those of you who've done so with small children, you certainly remember the ride called It's a Small World. And for some of you who live a tortured existence, that song is still repeating in your head right now. <laughs> but where did that idea of a small world, 
no divisions, no wars, no fighting among the races or the nations. Where did that idea come from? Well, once upon a time, there was a man. And not Walt Disney. And this man taught us about this, and he prayed about this. He described to people God's hope for reality, and he prayed that that reality would come to fruition, that it would come into being. He didn't have any money. He didn't have any connections. He didn't have any power. He didn't have anything. No office. All he had was his life which he lived before people and his words, which he taught, with which he taught and prayed. And then all of a sudden in history, in this little blip in history, the timeline of history, the world of which he spoke started happening. People started coming in. People who had a lot of money got down on their knees and washed the feet of slaves. It really happened. Nobody had ever done that before in history. Look it up. Jews and Gentiles who once hated each other, this is particularly relevant today, became like brothers and sisters. And they said strange things like, in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Thomas Cahill says that this was the first expression of egalitarianism in human history. It actually happened, and it happens still, when, where, and as God's people seek God and seek his kingdom. And that is the church when the church is at its best. And it's not just that there was never a community like this before. There wasn't even the idea of a community like this anywhere in human history prior to Jesus. In the ancient world, there were governments and guilds and there were philosophical schools and there were various tribal religions and there were households and there were families and different sorts of organizations and units. But there was never a community or a world like the one Jesus described and for which he prayed in John 17 and for which he came. May our prayer be that may his kingdom and his kind of world and what he envisioned and what he talked about and what he prayed for. May that come about in our lives, in our world, in the church, outside the church, by his grace, in us, through us, for his glory, and for the world's joy. Let's pray. God, Christmas, Advent, and Christmas have been and are about many things. They have been for us. They have been for the church. About many things and a variety of things. Your coming, your incarnation, your desire, your purpose, your mission, too, were about multiple things. But help us this evening to at least hear and embrace one. That you, Father, Son, and Spirit are one. And that you desire that sort of unity among your people. And even on this big earth. Which is actually kind of small. Under your loving care. Make us one as you are one. Make your church one. Make us one with, other, one, with one another. Save us from hate and anger and division and name-calling and insults and revenge and bitterness and division. Help us to love our brother and sisters. Do away with the chains. Forgive our part in oppression. Bring about your gospel of peace. We pray in the name of Jesus together. Amen.